Well, let me welcome you all again to this final session. Welcome to all of you online. Yes, this is the conclusion for the Follow Me series. Um, we will take a break for the summer. We will come back in the fall, and we're going to be doing two different studies in the fall. The first one is going to be called The Uniqueness of Christ. We're going to look at why he is set apart from anybody at any time through his own words, through the words of the scholarship that has surrounded him, through his relationship with his father, the relationship with us, why he is unique. It's, it's a wonderful thing to walk through. Um, we're then going to follow that up with a three-part book study, the, the smallest books in the New Testament. We're going to walk through Philemon, 2 John, and 3 John, those three books back to back to back. So they're each one chapter. They're each absolutely packed with biblical truth, and they tell a unique story. Um, so we're going to dive into those, and that'll be our fall, fall semester as we come back. So again, you have an assignment for the summer. Read Ken Geyer's book, stay in the word, um, and we'll come back in September and start the new study. So you'll start getting the emails over the course of the summer. So again, welcome to all. Um, we're in this final step. I, I have started each of the major sections of this study with a quote by Albert Schweitzer. So let me quote part of it again for this morning. Jesus speaks to us the same word, follow me. And he sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands. And to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience exactly who he is. What we've tried to uncover is through the experiences of following Jesus through his own experiences, we've begun to discover who he is. But the important thing about that is, is he worthy of following? That's the question. And hopefully through this study, you can answer that question affirmatively. Yes, he is the one I want to follow. I had a good friend of mine who spent some time in prison. Um, and while he was in prison, he was not a believer when he went to prison, but a, a prison guard shoved the Bible through his, he was in solitary confinement, shoved the Bible through his door. And he said, Mark, I spent the next three years in solitary confinement, in one hour a day outside, and I spent that time with that one book. And he said, what I decided to do was this, I wanted to read the biblical account of Jesus and find out if he was a man worthy of following. I took all the divine stuff out of it. I didn't want that, and it's an interesting perspective. He said, I didn't want the divine to be the thing that attracted me to him. I wanted to know if he was a man in his character, in his presence, in his, in his spoken word, if he was a man worthy of following. And he said, after three years of studying him, I can tell you without a doubt, he is a man that is worthy to follow. Simply from the human perspective, he's someone you should be following. He said, now let's tack the divine onto it. And then you find out he is absolutely the man you should be following. So as we dive into this last segment, there's only one place in all of scripture that the ascension is given voice. And that's in the book of Acts, the very beginning of the book of Acts. It's the only place it's, that the actual account is spoken of. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't other references to his ascension, but this is the place where his ascension is actually described. So as we, as we do a running start into the ascension, let me remind you that we have been through his birth, the lineage of all that came through his birth. We've been through all the things that happened from his baptism forward. We've been through all of the issues that have happened from his transfiguration into Jerusalem. And we've been through everything that has associated him with his death, burial, and resurrection. The nice thing about it is we don't put a period after his resurrection. We are very fond of saying this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. But I want to put an exclamation to that. Because he's not just risen. He is ascended. 
We stop with he is risen, which basically means this. He's still walking around. If he's only risen, the things that are associated with his ascension never come to play. And why we don't talk about this, why we don't land the plane with his ascension, I will never know. Mm. Except if we don't talk about his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, we leave him without the truth of where he actually is and what he's actually doing. That's what's important about today. He is not just risen, he is ascended. And so we're going to look at what that means in terms of his reign, in terms of his promises to us, in terms of the things that are attached to his ascension that we live in right now. We don't simply live in the face of a risen Lord. We live in the face of an ascended Lord. And that means everything. So in one short lesson, <laughs> we're going to talk about the magnificence of the doctrine of his ascension. Ask a quick question. Yes. When he said that to Mary about don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended, is that what he was talking about? Is, yes. Is that ascension? Yes, absolutely. I've not gone to be with the Father yet. And don't cling to me is, is basically that statement of don't hold on to me. In fact, what he's trying to tell her is go tell, it, go tell somebody. Don't just hang here with me. Go let, let the truth be known. That's the reference there. So we're in Acts chapter 1. Again, the only place this is spoken about, let me give you a little historical background of this. The book of Acts is written by Luke, the historian. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is the Gospel account of all that Jesus did. And if you'll notice, when you read the Gospel account of Luke, it's very emotionless because Luke is a historian. He's going to give us the facts. There's a tremendous amount about Luke that is on this day and on this day and on this day and in this place. He's very specific about his details as opposed to Mark. Mark is one who says immediately. At every turn, and something happened to me. Mark is full of immediacy, something that happens quickly. The different perspectives, the different personalities that come into the gospel. As we move to the book of Acts, this is now Luke writing to his friend Theophilus. Theophilus, who he wrote the book of uh, uh, the gospel of Luke to, specifically to talk about the life of Jesus. And now he's going to talk about the life of after, and he says it in the very first verse. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So this is the former account, the book of Luke, the former writing that I gave you, which de describes all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So his scriptural account of the book of Luke is everything that Jesus taught and everything that Jesus did. Now we know it's not everything because John tells us you can't possibly put down everything. But here is, that's his account. And it's that account until this point in time, until the day in which he was taken up. A very specific, very identifiable day that Theophilus would have known about. And by the way, if Theophilus didn't know it, guess who would? The disciples who were standing there. Because in this account, in this first part of the verse, he says... This is the account up until the day he was taken up, and they watched it. You see that down in verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched. So these disciples watched the ascension. Just kind of picture that for a minute. Just to be standing there talking with him, and he gives actually this command of what they're supposed to do, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then all of a sudden... He just starts rising up, and they're standing there watching him, mouths open, agape. Notice again, Luke doesn't say anything about the emotional expression of this. He says, and he lifted off. <laughs> God, God beamed him up. Here, so he is just rising, and these guys are standing there talking. What would you be thinking? Dude. <laughs> what's he doing I mean can you just imagine the conversation or maybe there wasn't any maybe there was stone silence because Jesus is lifting off 
So they watched it. It was a witness. The disciples were a witness. He was taken up. It is a physical event. Notice that the account that Luke gives us is in the past tense, meaning it happened. And he was taken up into heaven, which is, by the way, where he is now. There is a physical place that Jesus exists today. Where? At the right hand of the Father, in his rightful place. This is where he is. By the way, he is risen, but he is also ascended. He is also now seated at the right hand of the Father. This is where he reigns from. It's a big word that we need to talk about here in just a minute. So, he's taken up. Keep keep going in the, in the text here. The former account I made of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. This is kind of the, the, the banner that's overarching the Gospel of Luke. So here's what's happened. The Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, whom he had chosen. So his whole account of the book of Luke is he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, once he was resurrected, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Infallible is, doesn't just mean indescribable. Infallible means you cannot prove otherwise. This is absolute truth. So Jesus, after his resurrection, shows himself, and we have three accounts of it. He shows himself, but he showed himself to these disciples by many infallible proofs. Things that he did in this time period that you cannot disprove. And the reason you cannot disprove it is because there were people who actually witnessed it including 500 people on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And I'll give you just a quick, quick for instance. There was a theory out there that those 500 people all hallucinated. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there was an empty tomb, because it, it's called the hallucination theory, literally. And it is that they all hallucinated. However, in all of psychological history, in all of the psychology that's out there, there has never been a reported case of the same, of two people having exactly the same hallucination. And what we're supposed to believe is that 500 of them on the shores of the Sea of Galilee had the same hallucination. Jesus appeared by many infallible proofs. 500 people. Now, let me just tell you what great comfort that means. Because now you have the disciples who are willing to be martyred, every one of them, for the truth that Jesus rose and ascended. Yes. That Jesus is the risen and ascended Lord. They were willing to die for that purpose. And no amount of proof could be disproven to say that that didn't actually happen. They were eyewitnesses. 500 on the shores of the Sea of Galilee were eyewitnesses. There is a tremendous amount of testimony to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And now there are disciples that said, and guess where he went? He ascended. Being seen by them during 40 days, so over this 40-day period of time, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now let me just ask you, when Jesus came and said this, follow me, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here now, and it's in me. I'm bringing the kingdom of God. In the 40 days after his resurrection, what did he do? He talked about the things pertaining to the kingdom. He never was not talking about the kingdom of God. And now he's talking to his disciples who are going to be sent out. We're going to get to this in just a minute, because it's an incredible thing to think. Jesus is saying... Go. And if I'm a disciple, I'm thinking, okay, he's resurrected. He's going to be with us. <laughs> but guess what he's going to say? You're, you're, going to be, you're going to be sent out. I'm going back to the Father. But the things that occur because of his ascension are the things that are so critical. So, Presbyterian pastor by the name of Garrett Scott Dawson wrote this in his little book. 
Um, it's a wonderful little book on the ascension. He said, Jesus' ascension into heaven is the completion step that makes all of the benefits of his life among us available now. Did you hear that? Yeah. His ascension is what makes everything that he promised to us available to us now. In fact, the doctrine of the ascension, so seldom discussed in the church, actually provides the gateway through which we may understand how we participate in the triune life of God through the work of Jesus Christ. If he doesn't ascend, the truth of the Trinity and the application of the Trinity in our life means nothing because he's not back in his regular place. He's not the ascended Christ. Listen to Hebrews 1.3. Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So after he had taken care of business, purged the world of sin and us of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He took his rightful place. He went back to where he was rightfully to be placed at the seat of power. Now, listen to it again. The brightness of God's glory, the express image of God's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Who's in control? Through his son, who sits at the right hand of power. Listen to Acts 2, 32 through 34. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. This is Peter's wonderful message. We're all witnesses. Every one of you remember. He's talking to the disciples. Remember, we're witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is one of the most incredible messianic psalms, Psalm 110, where David says, God says to my Lord. David says, God says to my Lord, my Lord being the Messiah, my Lord being the anointed one. God and the anointed one are speaking to one another. And David is recognizing the messianic psalm pointing directly to Christ from King David. Whose lineage is he in? <laughs> Who's pointing to the one who will be the forever king on the forever throne, 2 Samuel 7, that Davidic promise that Christ will reign forever. And by the way, where is he now? Seated at the right hand of the Father, where it was prophesied he would be. Ephesians 4.8 says this, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, I want to just ask you a quick question. If he hasn't ascended, what wouldn't we have? Holy gifts, Spirit. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, hope. If he hadn't ascended, would every knee bow? Would every tongue confess? Okay. You begin to see the importance of how the ascension plays into everything that we say today about what we believe about Jesus. Gary Thomas wrote in a little book called Holy Available. He said, there's a reason, a good reason, that the Bible records the ascension. It is not a superfluous event as if Jesus died and rose from the dead and we can rush through the rest of the rest of it and say, oh, yeah, he went back up into heaven. He died, and he rose from the dead. Oh, and he's in heaven. We lose something when the ascension becomes a forgotten appendage to the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. If we simply only speak of him as resurrected, we miss the final step, which is his ascension. Gary Scott Dawson says, what we lose is the fact that the ascended Jesus is the reigning Jesus. And I have an amen. amen. He is the reigning. What we lose is he's not just resurrected. He is reigning in his rightful place. And if we don't recognize that, we lose everything that's attached to that. All the prophetic promises, everything that's attached to him 
seated at the right hand of the Father doesn't come to pass because we've left him, granted, beautifully resurrected, but we've left him resurrected, which means he's still walking the earth. No, he's ascended and he is reigning. He goes on and says, of all the meanings of the ascension, this one is preeminent. Jesus has gone up to the right hand of God, the Father, exalted above every name and power. He reigns today. That's his proper place. And there, he's present. And he's present with us because he is there. So, what does his reigning mean to you? That's the one to challenge you to think about this summer. What does his reigning from the right hand of the Father mean to you? We can't limit our Christian experience to the incarnation and Jesus' death and resurrection. To be sure, these are precious truths that make our salvation possible. But let us press on to embrace the power, the hope, and the glory of the ascension, the reality of a living in the flesh Jesus. He is the embodiment of all that we can be when we surrender to his reign. Because he reigns, we can surrender to him. The importance of his reign, the presence of his reign. <laughs> Look at verses 6 through 8. Therefore, when they had come together, well, let me go back to verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, what in the world is the promise of the Father? Well, we've read another verse that talks about it, which he said, you have heard from me. Jesus has told them about the promise of the Father. And by the way, the promise of the Father doesn't happen unless he ascends. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There's the promise of the Father. You will receive the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, just hold on for a second. What has Jesus just told them? <laughs> He's just said, here's the promise of the Father. Stay here until you receive them. Wouldn't you be asking the question, what's the Holy Spirit? How's he going to come? What's he going to do for me? What, what's going to happen? What's... But no, here's what the disciples ask. And oh, by the way. When, or will you at this time, restore the kingdom of Israel? Their, their brains are just not on what God is getting ready to do. Their brains on, are on, why don't you do what I ask you to do? This is why it's so difficult. What the Jews believe is that he should have taken Rome and taken their oppression away. He didn't do that. Actually, that's not true. He did do that. He took the oppression of their sin away and replaced it with the indwelling Holy Spirit. But their, their request is, tell us when Jerusalem is going to be restored. Tell us when the Romans are going to leave us alone. Tell us when you're going to bring your kingdom here. Because you did, after all, say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When's the kingdom coming? <laughs> the kingdom that he's talking about is the kingdom that dwells here. Here. It's the kingdom that dwells because he is going to pour out his spirit upon us. And I love how he does this. Jesus puts the right perspective on it. Verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in, in, in his own authority. This is something that is the authority of the Father. By the way, Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Except one thing. The authority but when he's going to restore the kingdom. That's God's. That's God's alone. And Jesus even said, by the way, I don't know it. <laughs> so just let me tell you, if you hear of people that say it's going to happen at a certain date and time, <laughs> guess what they know? <laughs> they know something even Jesus doesn't know. <laughs> so don't land there. <laughs> that confuses me a little bit, though, because he doesn't say... Not talking about the day or the hour, he's talking about the times and the seasons. And there's other scripture that tells us we should know the times and the seasons. We know the times and the seasons when it's beginning. We know the um, yeah. the evidence that time that the time and season is coming. Those evidences are clear to us, and those are what they're talking about. But they're asking here, 
I want to know. I want to know when. A date. I want to know it now. Is it going to happen spring, fall, summer? What they're really asking is, you're resurrected. You're going to do it now, right? <laughs> yeah. He's going to bring the kingdom back now. Well, what Jesus is getting ready to tell them and has told them all along is, by the way, in 40 years, the temple, gone. They want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't hear that. So here's what he now he refocuses. By the way, that's the fathers, but now verse eight. But here's the contrast. Contrast is you're not going to know when the kingdom is going to be restored, but here's what you will know: you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, if you don't know this, that is, that verse right there, Acts 1, verse 8, is the book of Acts. That describes the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit comes. We know that in Acts chapter 2. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down. We see then that the disciples go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they are the witnesses of what Jesus Christ has done and who Jesus Christ is. First of all, in Jerusalem. And they would stay in the nice little bubble of Jerusalem if God didn't bring persecution in. God brings in persecution and they move out from Jerusalem to Judea. And then a little more persecution comes in and they move out to Samaria. A little more, person a little more persecution comes in and they move out to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts is the description of this con the concentric circles of the things that are happening, moving out from Jerusalem as the Holy Spirit through the disciples are pushing the word and the kingdom out to the ends of the earth. Is that still happening today? Yeah. Yes. And by the way, you're part of that. You have the power of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Now notice what Jesus says. Here's why you have the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of me. The word witness there in the Greek can be also translated martyr because being a witness is not always an easy thing to do. You, can, you may have to sacrifice family, you may have to sacrifice friends, you may have to sacrifice relationships, but who are you a witness of? Not just the risen Christ, but the ascended reigning Jesus Christ. That's who you are a witness of. And it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the words to go be the witness to the ends of the earth, to whoever he brings into your path. So we get this promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, and we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, let me give you this wonderful description. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a common occurrence for all believers that the Holy Spirit is poured out on us and becomes the bond between the still incarnate Son in heaven and his people still following him here on earth. The Holy Spirit is that bond between us and Christ in heaven and us and the work that's to be done here on earth. He is the glue that holds that together. Which, by the way, when you grieve him, it's because we're not doing the work that he has bonded us together to do. When we're divisive in the church, we are not being the glue that holds that peace and unity together. When we walk away, we're not, we're not adhering to what the Holy Spirit is doing in us for the expansion of the kingdom. And the expansion of, by the way, Christ who is risen and ascended and who reigns today. By this, the king, though physically absent, Jesus the king, physically absent, establishes a living tie between himself and his subjects. God's glory is recognized not just through forgiven people, but through transformed and compelling people. People don't come to you to ask you about Jesus because you're a believer. They come to you to ask you about Jesus because you are a transformed and compelling Believer, because you have the power of the Holy Spirit within you, who is working and orchestrating those <laughs> events so that somebody who needs to know Christ is going to come to you, or you're going to be pointed out to them. <clears throat> in some way, shape, or form, that's going to happen. And every one of you can attest to, at some point in your life, that God put a person right smack <laughs> in the middle of your life and basically said to you, tell them about Jesus. And we have the choice <clears throat> to obey 
the resurrected, ascended, reigning king or not? And by the way, when we obey, a lot of, a lot of great stuff happens. We get blessed tremendously because of our obedience. <coughs> but we still have the choice to be able to follow that or not. Mark? Yes. I had a workman in my house yesterday. <clears throat> AV security was new and had a deal. And anyone that comes to my house is going to hear about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, of course, if he knew Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, he said, I, I know. I said, so are you going to heaven? What, what, what's going to happen when you die? Well, I think. I said, no, no. First John 5, 13 says, these things are written that you may know. Not hope, not think, not want. And so we discussed it a little bit. And I said, before you go to sleep tonight, just to be sure, you might acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that he died on the cross for you, his blood paid for your sins, and know that you belong to him. Not think or hope. No. Amen. I left it at that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so a final point here, exactly to that point. One of the ways that Jesus makes himself visible is through you. This goes all the way back to our study of the life of glory, that we are to manifest the character of God to the world. Why? So they can see Christ in you and have the opportunity to open the door to spiritual conversation, talk to them about Christ, and bring another person into the kingdom. Now, by the way, just so you're aware, you're not responsible for their conversion. But just like Jane, we are responsible to open our mouths and tell them about the hope that's within us. The hope of a ascended reigning king who died on a cross for you and for me. So we're going to re receive power, one of the promises of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have power in us to be a witness and to understand this. And this is Gary Thomas again. He says, we serve the ascended and reigning Christ. The world may mock him we may, uh, and we may disdain his rule through our sinful rebellion, but the fact is he reigns. Now, we can participate in the spread of his kingdom, not simply by imitating how he lived life while here on earth, but by making ourselves available to his dynamic and life transforming presence within us. We do this by letting him change the way we think, the way we see, the way we feel, the way we hear, the way we speak, the way we serve, transformed in every aspect of our lives. And that's the life of Christ within us, made possible by the indwelling spirit who is within us. We are to continue his work, exercise his reign, manifest his presence, and build his kingdom. That's eternal work, friends. And by the way, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, it's exactly what the command was from God to Adam and Eve. Take care of my creation. Make me known throughout the world to my creation. It's what he wanted the Jews to do. Make me known throughout creation. It's what he wants the church to do. Make me known I'm a good and loving God. Look what I did through my son Jesus Christ for you so you could have eternity with me. He love you. That's why we have an ascended, reigning Christ indwelling us and the power of his spirit indwelling us so that we get a chance to tell others about the ascended, reigning Christ that we know who can absolutely change their lives. Listen to John 16, 7. Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now imagine that. He's looking at the disciples and he said, it's your advantage that I leave. Excuse me? Wait, how is it to my advantage that you're leaving? For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. If I don't ascend, guess what you don't get? You don't get the Holy Spirit. See how important the ascension is? If he doesn't ascend, he can't send the Holy Spirit. And by the way... <laughs> Here's the question that's been asked time and time again. Would you rather have Jesus beside you or the Spirit inside you? That's the choice he's given them right here. Would you rather have Jesus beside you or the Spirit inside you? And the answer to it is, I'd rather have the Spirit inside me. Which, by the way, that's New Covenant language. 
live in the new covenant, he's going to write his laws on our heart. Why? Because the spirit indwells us. And here's the truth. Jesus was still limited by his physical fleshly presence, so he couldn't be with everybody at the same time unless he ascends. And when he ascends, the power of his spirit now indwells all of us. That's why it's better to have him ascend, because each one of us gets him indwelling us. Listen to Philippians 3. For our, citizen, for our citizenship is on this stinky planet. Is that what it says? <laughs> no. No, our citizenship is where? In heaven. In heaven. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. If he is not ascended and reigning, guess what we don't have? We don't have a permanent citizenship. We don't have glorious new bodies. None of that occurs. The promises that are attached to Jesus Christ are attached to Jesus Christ as the ascended and reigning Christ, not as simply the risen Christ. So what does his reality mean to you and to me? Gary Thomas says, celebrating Christmas gives us faith, the faith in the historical fact of the incarnation of Jesus, that he was born and walked the earth. Celebrating Easter gives us the assurance that Christ wiped away our sins by his sacrifice and his triumph over death. Celebrating the ascension gives us hope and points us toward transformation that we can become more and more like Jesus right now. The importance of the ascension. We get the Holy Spirit and the power within us to be transformed, 2 Corinthians 3, transformed from glory to glory by the power of the Holy Spirit, more and more and more into the image of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's one final thing that we need to talk about that's associated with his ascension. Verses 9 through 11. Now, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Isn't that a great way to phrase that? A cloud received him. It's like the cloud went, come on up here. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, the way Luke describes this, they looked steadfastly, meaning they were staring <laughs> as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So they're staring at Jesus going up, and they're not noticing two men in dazzling white standing right next to him. And these two said, men of Galilee, <laughs> why do you stand gazing up into heaven? <laughs> Didn't did you just see it? Well, I've never seen anything like that in my life. He's, he's rising up. Why would I not be gazing at this? And there's, what they're getting ready to say is focus your attention on who he is and what's coming after. This same Jesus. Notice that. This same Jesus. Not an imposter, not somebody else. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Here is the promise. And this is the promise we get. If he doesn't ascend, he won't descend again. He's not coming back if he's not the ascended reigning Christ. Because he's ascended, we get a promise. And the promise is he's coming again. If he's still here, he can't descend. But because he's ascended, he can descend. Just really exciting stuff. So the same Jesus was taken up. That was taken up as past tense. It is an actual physical act that occurred. Taken up into heaven. By the way, he's taken up into the place that is our residence. Our citizenship is there. We are with him. And by the way, any place that Christ is is going to be heaven. Just yeah. so you're aware. And we'll come back in a like manner. The promise and the focus of why our life has value now because he will return. He will return, John 14, for us. He's gone to prepare a place for us. There's work that he's doing right now on your behalf, preparing a place for you that when he comes, 
he comes back for us. And by the way, he said, and I'm not lying. Because if that wasn't the truth, I would have told you. So if you can believe that, then you can believe everything else that Jesus says. I'm coming back for you. There is a place being prepared for you. So what does his return mean? We can get discouraged by our sin and momentarily forget that he pardoned us by his work on the cross. We can get discouraged by the world and forget that through his ascension, he reigns over death. He reigns over the world. And he will reign when he comes again. Christ's reign in heaven assures us that all is well. Think about that one for just a minute. Because he is seated on the throne in his rightful place, all is well. Who has it completely in control? Even though on our side of the fence, it sure doesn't look like it. But on his side of the fence, absolutely. that's what Ecclesiastes is about, by the way. Down here, the world doesn't make sense at all. But up there, absolutely. I am in Christ, and he has triumphed. I am in Christ, and he has kind of done the work. <clears throat> I'm in Christ, and maybe left a little undone. I am in Christ, and he has finished the work. In him, by the Holy Spirit, I am kept in heaven. That's a great phrase. I am kept. My citizenship is secure in heaven. What is happening there, and it's happening there, can also, in a less perfect way, happen here through us. You ever think about that? Say the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess who does that will on earth? Us, we're his representatives. The power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Christ in us, we are his representatives to let what's happening in heaven be done here on earth. We are Christ's representatives. Oh, and then he says this. This is Gary Thomas. He says, with such a possibility before us, how dare we simply play at church? What is before us is the heavenly impact of us being the representatives of the risen, ascended, reigning Christ. And we have the opportunity to express him and expand his kingdom here on earth. To literally fulfill the Lord's prayer. What's done in heaven will be done here on earth through us. This is the serious nature of his ascension, and it is serious. So, as I look over this, the scope of the whole study, here's the truth I want us to capture. We can have hope and courage to embrace the presently reigning Jesus, who is manifesting himself through believers by the Holy Spirit, who call us to follow him wherever he leads. The whole point of this study is understanding, is he one worthy to follow? And by the way, I think the ascended reigning king is worthy of following. And because he's worthy of following, what he gives us is the opportunity to work alongside of him, partner with him in this life, in this work, to take the power of the Holy Spirit and be a witness to Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, through the world, which, by the way, blesses us, blesses others, makes our work here, our life here, matter for all of eternity and puts rewards with us in heaven. It's an amazing thing. And guess who gets to benefit from it? We do. Which we would not had he not ascended. None of that's possible. If he hasn't ascended. Final Ken Geyer quote. I've quoted him in every single study. Let me do a final Ken Geyer quote. Jesus comes to the weary heart to give it rest. He comes to the lonely heart to give it friendship. He comes to the wounded heart to give it healing. 
he comes to the sad heart to give it joy. And if not joy, at least the companionship of someone who has known what it's like to be sad and wounded and lonely and weary. The last book of the Bible was written by the last living disciple. And it ends with a prayer, come Lord Jesus. And after the prayer, a promise, I'm coming quickly. That word quickly, by the way, just to define it, means when he comes, it will happen fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what it means. Because you don't have to ask, why has there been such a time? We studied that in Second Peter. The reason there's been such a time is because he's waiting for us to respond. <clears throat> but when he comes, make no mistake, it will happen quickly. So who is he that calls us to follow him? He's the Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's the one whom God has called his beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. He's the one in whom we place our faith. He's the one who was transfigured in all of his glory. He's the one who was crucified for my sins. He's the one who was resurrected that death could not destroy. He's the one who has ascended into heaven. He's the one who sits at the right hand of God, and he's the one who reigns. The one who lives in us. The one who has made us new and transforms us through the power of his Holy Spirit. He's the one who will return as he promised and the one who has called me to follow him. He is the king. Amen. 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 Questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, yeah. I thought sure. it's just it's swirling around in my brain. It's <laughs> well, not really fully, fully developed. developed. But when they said this same Jesus... So the same Jesus is fully God, fully man. So that's who's sitting next to the Father is fully God, fully man. So he literally changed eternity for himself. Like that just blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't seem like it should be possible. Not only that, but he changed eternity for you. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but for, yeah. for everything. That's I right. Mean, it's <laughs> yes. That's exactly right. Yeah. It is rather mind-blowing. I'm not even going to comment. I'll just leave that one hanging. <laughs> yes. I was reminded that on a, a trip we had to, um, it was a cruise, but it stopped in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And my, my mother's parents were both from Sweden. And when we were there that um, day, our little guide, we drove to a town near Stockholm, and she said, oh, I'm so sorry today. The stores will be closed because it's going up day. And I said, oh, and I said to the woman, do you know what that means? I mean, click, you, you get it right away. She said, well, that's just a holiday we have here. She had no idea. And I said to her, oh, that's... Ascension days. That's what God did not just not tell you. But it was just a shock. And the Lord just brought it to my mind now. Wonderful. Going out there. Going out there. So let me, on top of that, thank you, Nancy. Let me let me make this statement. Um, I would be fascinated to know how many people in church today would understand that. Because we don't talk about the Ascension. No. no. And I don't know why. I've never understood why this magnificent exclamation point to the life of Christ is never discussed. And it's not discussed, even though we only have one passage, but the effect of the ascension is seen over and over. We've read 15 verses that deal with the effect of the ascension. And you can read the ascension into just about anything that goes on in the New Testament. In fact, you can read a lot of it in the Old Testament, in the prophetic words. But why we don't recognize that. I, you know, we celebrate Easter, the risen Christ, and it's marvelous to celebrate the risen Christ. But 40 days later, what we don't recognize, we just simply don't do it if we don't recognize the ascended Christ that he is where he is today because of that. They don't relate ascension to the Holy Spirit. If there was no ascension, there would be no Holy Spirit. True. And they don't teach a lot about the Holy Spirit. That's a good point. That's true. That's a good point. Yes, Chris. I was just thinking about how, um, as you were all saying about 
how the church kind of being, and yet the church has overlaid the Old Testament or the what the Jews were celebrating of Pentecost, correct? The 50 sure. days of 50 mm -hmm. weeks and how um, could you speak to that? Was he Jesus again fulfilled that prophecy sure. as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I um he didn't come, he came to fulfill it all. Mm -hmm. And in fulfilling it all, you can point to everything. You can, I mean, you can point to it all. Go back and take all the feasts. Where do the feasts point you to? What does Pentecost point you to? What does Passover point you to? Time and time and time and time and time again, he becomes the focal point of all of it. Um, even the Passover meal. At every turn, the Passover meal describes him and his death and, and resurrection. Um, Old Testament Psalms, all of it relates specifically to what he has done. Mm -hmm. His ascension, which is, again, it's that, that thing that I don't, we, we can celebrate a lot of different things, and we do celebrate a lot of different things in the church. And I'm not saying the church don't, but we put a huge emphasis point on Easter and very little emphasis point on the ascension. Mm -hmm. And should we put an emphasis on Easter? Absolutely. Do not want to forget what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. But where he is today and what he has given us because he's ascended, mm -hmm. it's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it would be a really good thing for you this week just to say thank you, Lord, for giving me the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because his ascension brought that about. Mm -hmm. So It seems like we should, instead of Easter comes and goes and then Boom, we're going to get into another book. The book of the Bible, we're going to start a new series. It seems like the following week should be on the ascension. I mean, that would just make perfect sense to me because then you're thanking him not only for saving us and rising again, but for well, yeah, tag team and the Holy Spirit to come down. And if you consider, look at Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Yes. Yeah. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Uh -huh. Why? Because I've ascended. Yeah. I'm now in my rightful place. And the great comfort for all of us, and I know we we sit here and we think, yes, I know where Christ is, seated mm -hmm. at the right hand of the Father. But that was always part of the plan. Yeah. And the great comfort is that is where he is, reigning and ruling today. Mm -hmm with his Holy Spirit empowering us. It puts a whole different, in my view, puts a whole different perspective on what I'm doing in this life. I'm serving the reigning Christ in power with the Holy Spirit in me, in power with me and a purpose for that Holy Spirit to be in me to tell others about it, to witness him to others. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 says, he, he in us, as I am looking at him, the power of the Holy Spirit transforms me from one character trait at a time. Well, why am I needing to be transformed? Because guess what? I'm not like him. And I need to be like him. I want to be like him. And because I want to be like him, there is great opportunity for me to be able to share Christ. Now, again, take that all the way back. This is the original command that God gave to Adam. Yeah, Go be my image bearer. Go show the world me. I, there's a lot that I do that I don't want the world to see and think that this is how Christ is. But as I'm being transformed more and more, there's a lot of me that can show off Christ because I have him indwelling me. And if he's in me, I want them to see him, not me. So transform me. And this is, I mean, Thomas said it, people are attracted to a transformed and compelling believer, not just simply a believer. So can you be excited today yeah. because he's a reigning Christ? Can you be excited today because he indwells you? Can you be excited today because you have a purpose, an eternal purpose, mm -hmm. that your life makes sense, that there is meaning to your life because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Yeah. I'll give you a... Um, one of my absolute favorite and least favorite exercises when I was a first year student in seminary, um, the professor, many of you know this guy, um, uh, I won't even 
walk into who he was, but he would teach you this. He would say, look at Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, let me tell you how important this verse is. I want you to write down on a piece of paper 25 observations. They can't be the same. They have to be different. 25 observations. For instance, here's an observation. You. This is me. Shall receive power. Shall receive is a verb tense that says this is going to happen. I receive power. So you make these observations. You turned in those observations. 25 of them. You got to write. And then he said, here's your next assignment. 25 more. 25 more. <laughs> and then he said, here's your next assignment. 25 more. Wow. Out of this one verse, we had to come, and they couldn't be repeated. We had to come up with 75 op simple observations about what this verse meant. The depth of this verse is magnificent. And its effect on us is eternal. <clears throat> and for him to say, I don't want 75 observations. Let me just tell you how deeply and how long you can think about one verse. <laughs> a long time and think very deeply because you had to creatively come up with what is this verse? What's the observations of this verse? 75 of them. Try 25. Just take this verse and try 25 observations and see what the Holy Spirit brings to mind in terms of how that verse affects you. Because it does. Did you come up with 75? I came up with 75. I can't say they were all good. <laughs> <laughs> did you pray first? Because I know, you know, when we first started oh, yeah. colleges, of course. Bible study, you would always tell us, pray before you even open the word. Because if you don't, you're not going to have your power. Yep. You know, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to the repeat. Yep. Well, so I know you had your prayers every month. <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest prayer was, Lord, help, help me be creative. <laughs> I mean, I, was, I got down to really foolish things like the word holy has four letters. <laughs> That's not a good observation. <laughs> not a good observation. Yeah. One thing to consider about the ascension is what's the alternative? Ooh. Oh, God. I don't even want to think about the alternative. If he's not ascended, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the scripture tells us it's appointed man wants to die and then comes the judgment. So he did die and he was judged. <clears throat> he couldn't die again. Nope. That, I mean, that would just be not only anticlimactic, but, <laughs> but spiritually <laughs> devastating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Anything else? So, Mark, was the Holy Spirit in heaven then as he always had been yeah. until Christ sent? Well, and you look throughout the Old Testament, I mean, he was, he was sent, for specific, yeah, sent for specific reasons. But this is this was the purpose for Christ, one of the major purposes for Christ to ascend was to send the Spirit so that we would have the Spirit, which is why it's so much better because Christ in a physical body couldn't be, in his incar incarnate body couldn't be, at all places at all times, but with us and dwell by the Spirit, we can. That's another thing he gave up for us, a spiritual body. Mm -hmm. he, he became physical mm -hmm. for all eternity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I just think, when I think about that and power he had before he was physical. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't Very think that was a sacrifice. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Yeah, Chris, one final comment? I was just thinking about his love for us and how much he loves us and walked among his disciples and loved them but he said it is better if i go away and how he said a restore in his rightful place he is with the father and i think about prayer that we go to the lord and he pleads our case mm -hmm. and how prayer is expanded because of him being in his right his rightful majesty his glory i think one of my favorite verses if you go to the beginning of the upper room Jesus knew certain things. He knew he was returning. He knew his time was coming short. But he also knew he loved the disciples to their completion. Mm -hmm. He loved them through to their maturity. He desired them to be mature in him. And he loved them all the way through it. 
So even while they're arguing who's going to be the greatest, and by the way, he puts that to rest very quickly in the upper room. Uh, but from that, he loves us to our completion, loves us to the end. That word translates to completion. He loves us to full maturity, he loves us into full maturity. Um, and that's that's his desire for it. So, okay, thank you for persevering through these weeks. We will take a break. We'll come back in September. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the truth of the ascension. Thank you for the truth that you have ascended and you have reigned and that you've commanded all. Thank you, Father, for the work of your Son on our behalf on the cross, for the work of our, your Son on behalf of us in his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And we thank you that we can believe firmly in an ascended, reigning Christ. God, you did this for us. You did this for your, out of your love for us. You did this so that we would be with you. Our citizenship is secure because of this. We thank you for this incredible truth, and I pray it would be resident within us and visible within us as we live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all online. Thank you all here. Yay. Have a great, great I bless Mark. Have a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you so much.